Welcome everyone to the Friends of the Semmel and a special lecture series or special lecture for the Friends of the Semmel Endowed Chair. This is a great opportunity for the Friends of the Semmel to showcase for outstanding applicants for this endowed chair. I'm, my name is Michael Irwin. I'm the faculty advisor for the Friends of the Semmel, and it's my pleasure to moderate this event today. But before we begin, I'd like to just give you some background about the Friends of the Semmel. The Friends of the Semmel for the Institute of Medicine is dedicated to improving the lives of people with mental illness. And it does so by supporting research that advances innovative treatments. It does so by sponsoring educational programs. And the goal of this act, these activities is to raise awareness about mental health in the community and to erase stigma. Importantly, the Friends of the Semmel board and program has many other aims, and one of them is to foster the next generation of translational scientists who can perform and conduct research in mental health and mental health treatment. They support opportunities for career development and do so in part by a very robust Friends of the Semmel Scholars Program, which is currently uh, in its probably 10th year. That Scholars Program provides seed funding for early career investigators. This today is a brand new initiative and we are very appreciative of the generosity of the Friends of the Semmel, who have now endowed a chair, an endowed term chair and this is a substantial step in supporting the next generation of translational scientists in mental health research to have a Friends of the Semmel Institute chair. This three-year term endowed chair will support the value of translational mental health research at the UCLA Semmel Institute. It will foster the development of an early career faculty who's engaged in education and research in neuroscience and human behavior. And clearly, from what you'll hear today, it's going to identify a person who is doing groundbreaking research to understand disorders of the mind and the brain and the development of innovative treatments for mental health. So this is a tremendous opportunity. And the committee um, that I'm also chairing has re been reviewing the applications. And we are have the pleasure today of hearing from four of the top ranked individuals. And one of these will be recommended to be appointed for this three-year term chair. So without further uh, conversation from me, I wanna now present to you um, Shula Green, Shula Mike Green, who's an assistant professor in residence in the Department of Psychiatry. And before I present her, I wanna just also, I forgot to tell you some logistics. And as a moderator, at the each individual that's going to be presented today has an opportunity to speak for around 20, 20 minutes. And then I will moderate questions. And so any questions that you have and during this Zoom presentation, please submit to the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen, uh, and the icons Q&A. And I will in turn moderate those questions at the end of each presentation. Um, we are on a very strict time schedule. And so every half hour, there'll be an, another presentation that will be, um, that will be, be, be provided. So today we're gonna to first begin with Sheila Mike Green, as I said, as an assistant professor in residence. Um, her title of her presentation is Altered sensory process processing across neuropsychiatric disorders from neuroscience to intervention. Shula White. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, thank you so much for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to speak. What I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a core component of how we interpret and navigate our world. So that is how we process and how we regulate our responses to sensory information. This is something we often take for granted, 
But if it goes wrong, it can actually make life really challenging. So as an example, right now, most of us are probably not paying too much attention to the feeling of the chair we're sitting in or extraneous sounds like cars going by outside um, because we adapt to these consistent sensory inputs in order to pay attention to what are hopefully more novel and salient, salient inputs like right now, hopefully the sound of my voice. But for individuals who have sensory over-responsivity, they may continue to attend to all of these incoming stimuli, leading to this feeling of overwhelm and just too much information. And there's a number of types of these altered sensory processing um, challenges that can be seen across different neuropsychiatric disorders. But today I'm going to focus on sensory over-responsivity because it is particularly impairing as well as being particularly prevalent across different clinical groups. Sensory over-responsivity, also called SOR, is characterized by a negative reaction to or avoiding um, sensory stimuli, such as loud noises, scratchy materials, and bright or flashing lights. It's extremely common in autism with rates up to 70% or higher, but while less well-recognized, it's also found at very high rates in other conditions, including ADHD, anxiety disorders, fetal alcohol syndrome, children with early life adversity, and children born preterm. I wanna give you a sense of how it feels to be somebody who has sensory over-responsivity. So these are some quotes of how people describe their experience. It feels like my brain is on fire. It's too much. You feel so sick, anxious, helpless, panicked. You can't tune out whatever noises you're hearing. They're just way too loud and they constantly go on and on. So as I'm sure you can imagine, SOR makes life very hard. It interferes with school and with work. It interferes with social interactions as well as with independent life skills. It's also associated with more mental health challenges like anxiety, depression, and behavioral problems. So we have this incredibly pervasive and impairing problem that is present across multiple clinical populations but when I started this work about 10 years ago, we really didn't know much at all about what caused it or how to treat it. So I set out to answer some fundamental questions about the neurobiology of sensory over-responsivity. Like, is the brain over-responsive to sensory stimulation? And if so, why? I'm going to share with you three very promising mechanisms that we have identified that likely play a key role in SOR including reduced habituation to sensory stimulation, reduced prefrontal downregulation, and altered excitation to inhibition in the thalamus. There was also, and really there still is, almost no empirical research on SOR from a clinical standpoint. For example, despite how common SOR is in autism, there was little understanding of whether it directly impacted social skills, and if so, how. There was also little information on, on how to treat it and particularly how to personalize treatments across different groups or ages. So today I'll touch on how our improved understanding of the neurobiology of SOR is helping us address these critical questions. First, a little background on myself and my lab. So this is our lab. Um, it's called the Sensory Cognitive and Affective Neurodevelopment Lab. And that title speaks to the fact that we're interested not just in basic challenges with sensory processing, but also their downstream effects on higher level processes like attention and emotion regulation. My background and training is as a clinical psychologist and that training really um, frames how I think about my research. So my goal is to take what I see with my patients, what I see in the clinic, what people are really complaining about is challenging their life uncover the biological mechanisms of these symptoms, and then use that biological understanding to create new interventions that will improve people's quality of life. We take a multi-method approach, including functional magnetic resonance imaging to examine how the brain responds to sensory stimulation, magnetic resonance spectroscopy to measure levels of neurotransmitters like GABA and glutamate, which can help us identify excitation to inhibition imbalances, physiological arousal like heart rate and skin conductance, and standardized behavioral assessments to study observed sensory responsivity behaviors. Our goal is to use this research to directly inform clinical practice. 
For example, to better understand how sensory processing develops from infancy through adolescence and for whom it may get better over time versus needing ongoing intervention. We're also working to develop both behavioral and psychopharmacological treatments. So going back to our key questions, first I'll talk about some of our initial research on brain responses to aversive sensory stimulation. The studies I'm gonna talk about are some of the very first human functional imaging studies demonstrating the key brain regions involved in sensory over-responsivity in children with autism spectrum disorders. For these studies, we used mildly aversive sensory stimuli while children are in the MRI scanner. We've used a number of types of visual, auditory, and tactile stimuli, similar to the kinds of things that kids complain about in real life, like loud traffic sounds, scratchy fabrics, or flashing lights. What I think is really exciting here is that across all of these different kinds of stimuli and multiple different studies, we actually see a fairly consistent pattern of results. That is, we see extensive neural hyperactivation in children with autism compared to typically developing children in response to these mildly aversive sensory stimuli. Particularly, we see greater activation in sensory cortical regions like auditory cortex or somatosensory cortex, as well as regions that are really important to salience and attention like the amygdala or the insula. Even more importantly, hyperactivation in these regions is correlated with parents' report of their children's sensory over-responsivity. So children who have more severe SOR show greater activation in these sensory and attention related brain regions. Before these studies, parents knew that their kids were having meltdowns or putting their hands over their ears or refusing to wear shoes, but really we didn't know why. So this was our first insight into why children were having such intense responses to sensory information. And it really validates the experience of people who are saying things like, oh, my brain feels like it's on fire. So once we knew the brain was overreactive, we wanted to know why. For example, is SOR caused by an initial very strong response or is it caused by a deficit in ability to habituate to stimuli across time? We examined habituation in the amygdala because of its important role in attention and salience detection, as well as the fact that it is heavily involved in anxiety, which commonly co-occurs with SOR. We looked at amygdala response to tactile and auditory stimuli across an eight minute period. In typically developing children in red here, the amygdala did what we would expect it to do. It shows an initial response to these new stimuli, then quickly decreases. In children with autism who don't have SOR in blue, they show a very similar pattern. But in the children with autism who have sensory over-responsivity, Interestingly, the amygdala initially decreases and then increases again, as if they can't maintain habituation across time. This suggests that SOR may be less about initially identifying sensations as a threat and more about having trouble tuning them out over time. This could lead to that feeling people have expressed of sensory overload as the brain tries to attend to all incoming sensory stimuli rather than being able to prioritize attention. Our findings of these habituation differences in children with autism who do and do not have sensory over-responsivity led to the next question. Are the children without SOR really responding in a typical way at the neural level, or do they have compensatory neural mechanisms that prevent them from showing over-responsive behaviors? In particular, we were interested in knowing whether, the, whether prefrontal regulation might be helping reduce amygdala response in a subset of children with autism. So we looked at how functional connectivity with the amygdala changes when the children are experiencing the sensory input compared to when they're not. There were significant group differences in connectivity with this orbital frontal region of the prefrontal cortex during sensory stimulation. Importantly, there was a difference between children with autism who had high versus low SOR. The ASD children with low levels of SOR seen in blue had significantly more negative connectivity than either of the other groups. This pattern of negative connectivity is usually thought to indicate prefrontal downregulation of the amygdala because as prefrontal activation goes up, amygdala activation goes down. On the other hand, we don't see this negative connectivity in the ASD group with high SOR in green. We also don't see it in the typically developing group in red 
but it could be that typically developing children don't need to downregulate the amygdala because they don't have overactive amygdala responses to begin with. These results helped us understand for the first time that kids with autism who look like they have typical sensory processing in terms of their behavior may actually not be typical at the neural level. In other words, their brains may be working harder to prevent sensory over-responsive behaviors. This suggests that interventions that engage prefrontal cortex could be helpful for SOR, and I'll talk about this a little more later. However, we know that multiple brain networks are involved in SOR, and another key region of interest for us in terms of sensory regulation is the thalamus, which is an important area for relaying, integrating, and filtering sensory information. Some more recent research from our lab suggests that the thalamus may play a key role in SOR. So first, we found that children with autism and SOR have reduced thalamocortical connectivity, but more connectivity between the thalamus and the amygdala during sensory stimulation. Communication between the thalamus and the cortex is really important for inhibiting sensory information. Reduced thalamocortical connectivity could mean that the thalamus is not getting the message to stop sending sensory information to the cortex. Instead, the thalamus is signaling the amygdala to keep paying attention to the stimuli. To see if reduced thalamic inhibition could be in contributing to SOR, we examine levels of the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA in the thalamus using magnetic resonance spectroscopy. We found that children with high SOR have lower thalamic GABA as well as GABA to glutamate ratios, suggesting they have atypical inhibition to excitation in the thalamus, which could be allowing too much sensory signal to get through. So we're starting to untangle these complex neural mechanisms underlying SOR, but in the meantime, there are people out there who really need treatments right now. And we know enough to start translating this research into intervention. One of the first questions we asked that was more directly related to clinical practice was, does SOR affect social processing? And if so, how? This is particularly important because for decades, sensory processing was overlooked in autism research and treatment in favor of the social and communication concerns that were considered to be the core deficits. However, if SOR is actually contributing to some of these core deficits, then that would change how we think about treating them. To begin answering this question of how SOR affects social processing, we had children complete a social cognition task in the scanner with and without a tactile distractor. So they see the setup to a scenario, and then they get one of two possible endings, either a sincere ending or a sarcastic ending. And they have to just say, did John mean what he said, yes or no? So it's a basic social inference task. And then for half of the trials, they had a scratchy fabric rubbed on their wrist, which served as a sensory distractor. We know from a number of prior studies that children with autism can complete this task with excellent accuracy, but they show greater brain activation while doing so, particularly in regions related to higher level language and social information processing. We saw that here as well. This is usually interpreted that the children with autism, their brains are working harder to accomplish this task. But the important thing here is what happens when we add that tactile distractor while they're doing this task. Compared to without the distractor, the ASD group now shows significantly reduced activation in those key language and social processing regions. This suggests that the ASD group may be overwhelmed by the tactile stimulus and can no longer sustain effortful processing in these regions. This is really important because it shows for the first time how SOR can disrupt social processing particularly for those with autism. And this suggests that treating SOR could potentially improve some of those core social challenges in autism. That brings us to a key question. We now know that SOR is associated with deficits in sensory habituation and with regulation challenges, and we have some idea how it may detract from social processing. So how, what can we do to help? Over the past decade or so, SOR has been increasingly recognized in the community, but there are still very few evidence-based treatments. Generally, most intervention efforts have been focused on making people with SOR more comfortable. So for example, some movie theaters have sensory-friendly showings where they turn the volume down. There are these um, sensory break rooms that can be found at places like schools or sports stadiums. 
And some organizations are giving out these sensory kits, which include things like noise blocking headphones. These interventions actually are a big step forward to making people more comfortably, com more comfortable, but notably they target changing the environment and so they're somewhat limited in scope because they can't treat the underlying sensory challenge. Our greater understanding of the neurobiology of SOR can help us create more effective treatments. We recently received an R01 from the National Institute of Mental Health focused on how we can use what we know about the neurobiology of SOR to develop behavioral interventions that will improve sensory regulation. We're examining how sensory regulation develops naturally across adolescents and how we can improve it for those individuals who don't develop it naturally. For example, SOR tends to decline somewhat across adolescence and into adulthood, but you can see there's a lot of variability so that while it may decline on average, it still remains a problem for many people. We also find that as children with autism get older, they show greater prefrontal cortical responses to sensory stimulation, suggesting better regulation across time, though again, there's a lot of individual variability. So an important question is who gets better with age and who doesn't, and can we engage prefrontal activation earlier in development and for more individuals to reduce the impact of their SOR? As part of this project, we're testing out two potential interventions adapted from the emotion regulation literature. Attentional redirection uses verbal cues to shift attention away from sensory stimuli and towards key social cues. Reappraisal trains individuals to think about the stimuli differently. For example, describing it in a more objective way like a news reporter, rather than focusing on how it makes them feel. These interventions are similar to some of the strategies used in cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety. So if these adapted versions are effective, it would be relatively simple to integrate them into existing therapies. I'm gonna give you a quick example of the attentional redirection method. So if you remember, we found earlier that sensory distraction reduces brain activation in, in important social and language processing regions. However, we then subsequently used attentional redirection by giving participants explicit instructions to pay attention to the tone of voice and the look on the face. After this instruction, children with autism were able to re-engage those social and language processing regions, as well as medial prefrontal cortex, even during the sensory distraction suggesting that the attentional direction allows them to use regulatory regions such as medial prefrontal cortex to sustain processing in important social and language regions of the brain. Also as a future direction, we're working on developing treatments that target the neurobiology of SOR even more directly. This includes testing a beta blocker, propranolol, as well as transcranial magnetic stimulation to determine if they can reduce the hyperarousal and neural overreactivity that characterizes sensory overresponsivity. These ongoing studies are funded by the Brain and Behavioral Research Foundation, the International Society for Autism Research, and the Eagles Autism Foundation. I just want to end by again emphasizing that SOR is not just a problem in autism, and we're also examining it in other clinical groups with a key question being whether there are shared and distinct mechanisms and then how we can develop personalized treatments. So briefly, I wanna show that we've also found elevated rates of SOR in other groups. So here you see anxiety and autism um, groups have higher SOR than our group of typically developing children. Um, here's another study where we looked at children with early caregiving adversity, and you can see in light green and in dark blue, are children who've been adopted from foster care or from um, international institutions, and they also have higher levels of SOR compared to non-adoptive controls. Both of these groups also showed neural hyperactivation to sensory stimuli compared to typically developing non-adopted children, though the networks involved showed some differences compared to children with autism. So this is an important future direction for us to determine these shared and distinct mechanisms across clinical groups to personalize treatments more effectively. So taken together, our research has provided insight into the neurobiological mechanisms of SOR, including that it's associated with neural overreactivity, particularly in sensory and attention brain regions, as well as being associated with reduced neural habituation, deficits in prefrontal downregulation, and altered thalamic inhibition. These new insights have provided the foundation to start developing treatments that are rooted in biology, 
including behavioral treatments adapted from cognitive behavioral techniques that increase prefrontal regulation, medications such as propranolol that could reduce hyperarousal, and neuromodulation of prefrontal cortex through techniques like transcranial magnetic stimulation, as well as working towards personalized treatment for different populations and ages of individuals with SOR. I just wanna end by acknowledging my funding sources, my collaborators, many students and research associates who made this work possible and all of the children and families who participated in our studies. Thank you so much. Dr. Green, thank you very much for that uh, beautiful presentation that we heard today, and the clarity of your work. Um, I'm waiting for some question and answers to come in. Please use the question and answer feature on your Zoom to identify questions. And I will give us a few moments to do so before we move into the next presenter. Okay, I'm just seeing some questions come in now. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, so I have a question from Susan Buchheimer saying, is there hope for specialized treatments using GABA or glutamate? Um, so there is hope, I think, um, for potentially um, examining GABAergic drugs that could increase um, GABA to glutamate ratio in the brain. So arbaclofen is a good candidate. Um, this is a drug that's that's already being tested for some other symptoms of autism um, and has some potential for um, also treating sensory over-responsivity. Great, you wanna feel the next questions, the next two questions, yes. Yeah, um, Chris Evans has a question saying, do you have thoughts about the areas of the amygdala that may be involved in the hyperactivity seen in those with sensory over-responsivity? That is a really great question. I love that. Um, you know, it can be challenging with the resolution we get using um, functional magnetic resonance imaging in, in wiggly children to sometimes pin down exactly what region of the amygdala we're looking at. Um, I do think that could be a great um, kind of direction for collaborations with animal model researchers, which is something that I'm working on as well. Um, so we've thought about, I've talked to some of my collaborators about doing things like using optogenetic strategies in animal models of sensory over-responsivity to actually turn on and off particular regions of the amygdala. Um, so that kind of study, I think, would give us more insight into um, kind of more specifically what those mechanisms are and exactly where in the amygdala we're talking about. And there's two questions regarding diversity and also biological variability that's sex dependent effects. If you could answer those two as well. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, diversity of, a of our samples. That's something that we actually really care about a lot. I think we're really lucky to be in Los Angeles, um, which is a place where, you know, there are, we have access to many different populations, um, different race, ethnicity. Um, our, our sample is about 30% white and the other 70% is a mix of um, Latinx, Black, mixed race, Asian, um, kind of somewhat, I think, representative of the population who lives here in Los Angeles. Um, when we look at our sample of kids who have um, early caregiving adversity, that is an even more diverse sample, kind of representative of who those, those kids are and where they're coming from. Um, it's something that we talk about a lot. We have a lot of conversations about, and we have um, been working to improve our recruitment materials, et cetera, think about where we're recruiting from and where people are coming from um, to make sure we're getting as diverse a sample as possible. Um, in terms of males versus females, that's also a really great question. So that's a kind of problem in autism research in general. Um, some, you know, a lot of research kind of is focused on males and doesn't generalize as well to females or doesn't look at sex differences. Um, we do have a, you know, I'm working with my co collaborator, Dr. Morella DePreto, on a large um, autism center of excellence network um, that is examining girls versus boys in autism. And so we're going to be collecting a large amount of data um, on some of these sensory responsivity measures in the girls versus boys and able to really compare, um, are we seeing the same thing? 
So far, we haven't seen behavioral differences. So we're not seeing that there is more sensory over responsivity in girls versus boys, but definitely there's a lot, a lot to follow up on there. And we have time for one last question, and that deals with any differences between M MRI versus fMRI. If you could quickly answer that question. Great question. So I think I think what you're asking is, do we see any structural differences that are associated with sensory over-responsivity? And I will admit that this is not um, a direction that we have taken yet. Um, we haven't really looked at um, whether brain structures, the sizes of certain brain structures look different. I ha there hasn't been anything in the literature at all showing this. Um, you know, there's a little bit about amygdala size with anxiety. So you might expect it could relate to SOR since the two are highly correlated. There's a really small amount of DTI research looking at structural um, connectivity and some, you know, some associations with SOR, but it's so preliminary that I don't know that, that we can come right. to any conclusions yet. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Green, for a really great presentation today. Thank and you. now we're going to transition to the next presenter. And that's Emily Ricketts, who's a, who's a health sciences assistant clinical professor. And she's going to be talking with us today about sleep and circadian disturbances as modifiable therapeutic targets in Tourette's disorder, a model for other developmental disorders. Dr. Ricketts. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, again, I'm Emily Ricketts. Thank you for having me. Um, so without further ado, I will begin the introduction. All right. So um, just in terms of my objectives, uh, today I'm going to provide a brief overview of sleep and circadian disruption in psychiatric disorders, and I will highlight Tourette's disorder as one example. I'll discuss um, future research directions and also implications for other neurodevelopmental disorders. So we know that sleep disruption and uh, psychiatric disorders frequently co-occur. Um, and really they reinforce one another, but also share common underlying mechanisms. So uh, with one being a disrupted circadian clock. Um, so we know that stress, uh, social isolation, um, altered light exposure, and certainly medication uh, resulting from psychiatric illness can contribute to sleep disruption. And in addition, cognitive and health problems, um, stress, uh, deficits in neurotransmission and neurodevelopment, uh, and also shared genetic susceptibility and inflammation can contribute to both psychiatric illness and sleep disruption. So sleep is regulated in part by our circadian rhythm, sometimes termed a 24-hour biological clock. Um, our circadian rhythm aligns our sleep-wake cycle and also cognitive performance with the night and day um, over an approximate 24-hour period. And um, this rhythm is generated endogenously um, by a master clock uh, housed within the supercryosmetic super nucleus uh, within the hypothalamus. And um, in addition, there are also peripheral clocks that reside in the central nervous system um, and, the, and various um, tissues within the organs of the body. Um, and many of these peripheral clocks feed back to the uh, central clock as well. Um, so our circadian rhythm is entrained by, or I guess you could say synchronized by multiple time cues and light is the strongest and the most important one. So we have a specialized um, light detection system um, in our retina that uh, directly projects to the central clock in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, and, you know, but in addition to light, um, also feeding, um, mealtime schedules and activity uh, serve as um, in training agents as well, or other time cues. Um, and so our circadian rhythm also orchestrates the timing of um, you know, multiple bodily processes. So this includes um, core body temperature and also uh, key hormones like cortisol and um, melatonin as well. And, um, and also appetite and other bodily functions. And um, as you know, previously mentioned on the, the prior slide, you know, disruptions to 
the circadian system and also the sleep-wake cycle uh, contribute to psychiatric illness. And uh, Tourette's disorder is one example that I will be discussing today. Um, so Tourette's disorder, or sometimes called Tourette syndrome, is uh, a neurodevelopmental disorder um, that uh, is really characterized by multiple, involuntary, repetitive, uh, stereotype movements or motor tics and one or more vocalizations, vocal tics lasting longer than a year. Um, it is more prevalent in males uh, at, at ratios of three to one to four to one. Um, tics usually emerge between four and eight years of age. Um, they peak in severity between the ages of 10 and 12. And then in many cases, they'll decline during uh, adolescence, um, such that by early adulthood, they um, are at you know, milder uh, levels for, for many cases. However, uh, for, for many others, uh, ticks do uh, remain at moderate to severe levels. And they, you know, they do fluctuate in severity over you know, the, the day, uh, weeks, months, years. And um, so it, you know, co-occurring psychiatric conditions uh, are the norm. So they're uh, present in about 85% of those with Tourette syndrome, um, as we can see in, in this iceberg image. So ADHD is uh, the most commonly comorbid condition. Um, in addition, obsessive compulsive disorder and behaviors um, is a, a close second. Um, but there, you know, there are a range of of other other issues. Um, that you know, sleep issues are um, among them. So sleep um, disturbance in Tourette's is uh, characterized um, by insomnia predominantly, um, but, but also parasomnias like uh, nightmares um, and sleepwalking, for example, and also sleep-related movement disorders like restless leg syndrome, uh, periodic limb movements, um, teeth grinding. Um, and, and in addition, uh, it's not uncommon to have tics that present during sleep as well. So uh, that ranges from about 14 to 100% of cases um, and has, has even been shown using polysomnography as well. Um, and daytime sleepiness is common too. Uh, in, some, in, a, in a study, uh, a case control study that we had completed in adults um, using actigraphy, we showed um, longer sleep onset latency or you know, longer time taken to fall asleep, uh, increased fragmentation of sleep and reduced sleep efficiency, referring to um, really the, the time spent asleep while in bed. Um, and that was in, in Tourette's relative to controls. And um, also we, we found uh, delayed um, self-reported circadian timing in this same study too. So what we were seeing is that um, those with Tourette syndrome were showing uh, an evening preference for activity uh, relative to controls. And um, sometimes this is called chronotype. When you think of, um, you know, when people talk about night owls and morning larks, um, this is what they're referring to generally. And, um, and, and evening, uh, I guess, delayed circadian timing um, or chronotype is, is common to uh, a number of uh, psychiatric and um, neurological disorders. Now, um, sleep and circadian rhythms are um, modifiable. Um, you know, I guess to our benefit and also our detriment as well. Um, so what we know is that exposure to evening light delays uh, sleep and internal rhythms um, and exposure to morning light advances sleep and internal rhythms. Um, and also, you know, melatonin has been, I guess it's, it's grown in, in its use over the years and a number of people uh, do take it. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that is also relevant here and evening melatonin um, advances sleep and, in, and internal rhythms. Um, it can be used both as a, what we would call soporific agent in that it can induce sleepiness if taken maybe within the hour before bed, but it can also be used as a circadian um, phase shifting kind of agent as well um, and can advance the rhythm too. And then morning melatonin um, delays sleep and internal rhythms 
although you know it is less effective at doing so um, than it is uh, at advancing them when given in the evening. And so now just to you know focus back on on light um, due to the effects of light exposure on the on circadian rhythms in sleep. Um, you know, light therapy has been used, uh, you know, for for a number of years um, to address, you know, to address these disturbances. And it it actually began with seasonal affective disorder and you know depression and seasonal affective disorder because light therapy has um, mood boosting and alerting effects as well. Um, and so, you know, there are vi a variety of different methods um, used to uh, emit emit light. Um, and the the white light box is the is a common standard historically, um, but over the years uh, people have begun to develop um, wearable devices um, because they are you know they increase the feasibility and ease of use. Um, and in addition, we have intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells in our retina, um, which project um, they you know they filter light and they project directly to the suprachiasmatic. Uh, nucleus, um, and they are more sensitive to blue-green light or short wavelength light. And so for that reason, um, blue light therapy devices have grown in popularity also. And um, so my pilot work, um, so this was funded by the Tourette Association of America, um, has focused on uh, piloting uh, short wavelength wearable morning light therapy in adults with Tourette's disorder. And so um, just considering the, the landscape um, of treatment for, for Tourette's, um, antipsychotic kind of uh, medications, dopamine antagonist um, are, you know, they work, they work for, for symptoms, but, you know, for a number of people, they, you know, the side effects are intolerable. They also you know, need to find switch medications um, over time uh, to find the right one. Um, and then also, you know, we do have behavioral interventions for Tourette's too. So we have um, a comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics. Um, however, you know, that the, I guess the treatment response rate for children is about 52%, for adults it was about 38%. So there is more that we could be doing to boost treatment response. And so um, this is, I guess, in, you know, this project is in service of, of, of doing so. And um, so, yeah, so basically we had adults use two weeks of morning light therapy. Um, they were using this wearable glasses-like device and they wore it for one hour immediately upon awakening at their average rise time from the week. Um, and, and in terms of um, what, we, what we found, so, so basically what we did is um, at baseline and or you know, pre-treatment and post-treatment, uh, we performed an objective circadian phase assessment. Um, and so we did this uh, using what is called dim light melatonin onset assessment. And so uh, basically what we, we're doing is we're trying to determine the time on the clock at which mel melatonin begins to rise in the evening when it is not suppressed by electric light or natural light. And so this is why we do this in a dimly lit room. Um, and so we, we do this by taking saliva samples every half hour for about a seven hour period. And, um, and so what we, what we found is that uh, there was a 45 minute um, circadian phase advance. So we, we did shift um, circadian phase earlier and you can see the average, uh, this is the average shift uh, on the left. Um, and then these are the individual ones. For, for each uh, participant. Um, but in addition to that, we did see um, significant improvements in anxiety, daytime sleepiness, um, and, and small improvements in tick severity and tick-related impairment that were also significant. Um, and, you know, this, keep in mind, this was a, a, a single, um, I guess, a single group pretest, post-test kind of design. 
And so, you know, the, the standard um, for, for really knowing uh, the degree to which something is, is helpful is, uh, you know, placebo controlled or sham controlled study. And so that is what is, you know, is needed as the next step, you know, again, with objective uh, measures. And, um, you know, one thing that is uh, interesting is just that, um, you know, the, the potential for, I guess, the study of um, a, a mechanism that might be shared. Um, and so really excess, excess postsynaptic D2 um, striatal dopamine is believed to underlie um, Tourette's disorder. Um, and be a, a mechanism that is involved. Um, but, you know, dopamine is also known to um, be a potent regulator of circadian function and also clock gene expression too. So um, this is a, a shared, a, a potential shared mechanism that could be worth exploring in the future. And then an additional area of, um, of research interest for me is uh, the neural mechanisms that, are, uh, that underlie sleep. Um, relative to wake in Tourette's disorder and also how they relate with tick symptoms and sleep disruption. And so um, this uh, can be explored using uh, Dr. Um, Eric Knopfsinger's, um, and he is, at, uh, he is at University of Pittsburgh um, or an adjunct professor there, but uh, he has a really a three-day um, fluorodeoxyglucose um, positron emission tomography and and polysomnography or sleep sleep study um, protocol. And um, really the, the idea is um, that this protocol allows one to um, sleep in, you know, in a sleep lab uh, while the, I guess the, the FDG injection is administered. Um, and, uh, you know, and so, the idea is that you're you're then able to wake the person person up after, um, and then do the imaging while they're awake, but still capture what their brain looked like when they were asleep. And so, so the the appeal is that you don't have to ask someone to sleep in the scanner, and instead you can have them sleep in a bed. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Nofsinger in some earlier studies had shown that. Um, healthy humans show decreases in glucose metabolism, um, an index of um, metabolic activity uh, from wake to non-REM sleep uh, within brain regions that are associated with arousal and wakefulness. So the hypothalamus, thalamus, and brainstem. Um, but what, you know, what he found when looking at uh, sleep disturbed psychiatric populations is that they show less of a reduction um, in terms of this this process. Um, and so my, you know, I, my interest is to, to really apply this uh, to Tourette's to, to better understand, um, you know, sleep, you know, what are, what are the, the neural pathways that are implicated in sleep in Tourette's? And um, I submitted a, a proposal with uh, collaborators in June and this will, it's under review now, we'll see what happens. Um, and so this, um, I guess, prior work has established uh, neural targets that uh, might guide uh, planned experiments in this area. So um, this image on the left is really showing um, the cortical and subcortical regions that are associated with, um, you know, tick expression or tick generation. And uh, the you know, the premotor cortex is certainly one um, supplementary motor area, um, you know, thalamus, and, and also prior preliminary work has uh, examined the neural correlates of sleep in Tourette's disorder um, using, uh, you know, a different kind of, of PET imaging. Um, and what they found was in increased blood flow in the premotor cortex during non-REM sleep uh, in Tourette's relative to control. So, Already we can see that, you know, the premotor cortex may be, you know, maybe a target. Um, and also, you know, uh, the thalamus is also relevant as that's involved in uh, arousal and wakefulness too. Um, and so this, you know, this particular research area has implications for um, a novel 
intervention um, that is, is called frontal cerebral thermal therapy or forehead cooling. And so this idea has, you know, has been in the literature, um, you know, here and there for a number of years and applied, uh, you know, in different ways. Um, this particular uh, device was developed um, by Dr. Nofsinger and, and collaborators, and it was developed to target the neural mechanisms underlying insomnia, um, that being, uh, you know, hypermetabolism in the frontal cortex. Um, and so in piloting this device, they did, they did show that it was associated with reductions in metabolic activity across the whole brain, frontal and cingulate regions um, in insomnia. And, and so this, you know, has neurobiological and also clinical relevance for Tourette's disorder. Um, and, and that, you know, insomnia is among the most common sleep disorders in Tourette's, um, but, but also the, you know, the pathophysiology of Tourette's does, um, does involve the, the frontal cortex as well. And so um, it's possible that this could help ticks in addition to sleep. Um, and, and even, it, you know, it's possible perhaps it, it could be used in the daytime. I mean, it's typically, it typically would be used in, during sleep. Um, yeah, so in terms of, um, and, and actually I, I did receive uh, funding from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation to um, pilot this uh, device in, in adults with Tourette's too. So I will be able to, I guess, clinically see how it affects ticks and sleep. Um, and then the idea is to be able to look at its effect on um, you know, neural correlates in future work. Um, but in terms of, of future directions, certainly um, carefully controlled studies are needed. Um, you know, placebo control, I guess, dose response kind of studies, uh, again, with, with objective measures. Um, and, you know, just, just to provide some examples. So, you know, the room that you see, so that's, that would be an example of where we would do uh, the circadian phase assessment. Um, so dim light melatonin onset assessment and, you know, taking, using salivates to take saliva samples. Um, in addition, pupillometry too is, is an area that uh, we're looking into exploring. So it can be used to measure a specific form of light sensitivity um, that can predict the circadian impact of light. And, um, and so that, you know, has implications for perhaps providing a, a brief, you know, I guess not non-labor intensive um, measure of circadian health and potentially, and um, and then also uh, spectrophotometry or or wearable light intensity measurement is another tool that we are uh, looking to use um, to better understand um, individuals' natural light environment and exposure and how that might differ between uh, psychiatric, uh, you know, individuals with different psychiatric disorders and also those who are free of psychiatric conditions too, um, and how it, how it impacts sleep-wake cycles and circadian disruption too. And then um, also interested in continuing uh, to uh, study uh, the, the effects of novel experimental therapeutics. So forehead cooling and, you know, is one example, um, and along with continued research in shortwave length light therapy, but also um, a project that I'm uh, just kind of stepping into is uh, really, uh, so pulsed light pulses. So using a uh, pulsed light, um, you know, as, as light therapy, because it's uh, been shown to be stronger at shifting circadian phase relative to continuously emitted light. And then also brain imaging and uh, sleep study, you know, PSG to understand uh, the relationship between sleep and neural function. And um, so, yeah, so this, you know, this research can really uh, serve as a model for uh, other neurodevelopmental disorders. We know that sleep disturbance is common in conditions like ADHD, OCD, autism, and, um, you know, the study of sleep and circadian rhythms could identify cross-cutting neural pathways in these conditions and, 
really the the interventions that you know I have a, I have discussed um, are relevant to these conditions and and also beyond. So, uh, these are just um, mentors and collaborators involved in this work, um, but you know also there are, there are many more, um, and uh, these are my uh, funding sources. So, thank you. Wonderful, Emily, Dr. Ricketts. Uh, this is a great presentation, very interesting um, ideas and, and thoughtful presentation. We have some, some questions and, uh, and I'm, I will turn them to you. You can read them. But the first question has, is from Robin Mandelberg. Um, she asks about, what about light from cell phones before bed? Yeah, that, that's a great question because that has been, that's been quite a hot topic. Um, you know, for, for a number of years. And I, you know, I guess from my understanding of it, the, I think the, the current thinking is that the light from the cell phones and, and the, the technological devices may not actually be what is driving um, circadian uh, delay and sleep disturbance. It may be some other aspects of using the device. Um, so for, for example, you know, there is some sleep displacement, just the fact that you are doing anything, you are pushing sleep back, but also that there is an, a, physiologic, um, a physiologically arousing effect of the activity that you are engaged in when you are using the device. Um, so if you're on social media, if you're on YouTube, that could be waking your mind up um, and it competes with sleep. Um, and then, Anne Marie Chang, so she had done, I believe she had done the most, maybe the most recent study looking at this. And I, I believe the light impacted sleep by 10 minutes and, and that it, it maybe delayed sleep onset by 10 minutes. And so I think the, the thinking is just that, yes, maybe there is a little bit of a significant delay, but it is, it's just, it, it's only 10 minutes. So um, I think it's some other aspects of it. Um, we have um, three other questions or uh, two other questions. Um, um, let me go to April's first because um, in part you've already answered uh, some of what uh, Dr. Bearden mm -hmm. has suggested, but we'll come back to that. April asks, uh, April Thames, Dr. Thames asks, what are the mechanisms behind this? It's the mechanisms behind this could apply to other populations such as uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety disorders that tend to be highly comorbid with Tourette's. And so are the interventions that you're proposing are potentially related to these other disorders? And, and that gets into the question of how generalizable findings to other anxiety disorders. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I do think that, that these interventions are, are generalizable, especially, you know, OCD, ADHD um, as well, because they're, you know, there are, you know, kind of considered basal ganglia disorders to some some degree, um, and I think I think ADHD in particular is extremely interesting just because of the the blur between the the symptoms of the disorder and the um, you know the the sleep deficits in the daytime, but also circadian disruption. So you know, if if one has executive functioning deficits and they don't get their homework done, and they're you know they may be up late for that reason or also because they are distracted on their devices. Um, but, but yes, there, you know, there are certainly, there certainly are, so I guess, innate kind of circadian differences um, between those with ADHD and, and controls too. But I just think it's, it's just an interesting disorder because of, you know, the effects of sleep deprivation would be inattention and they have inattention already. And yeah, so I'm, but, but I'm yeah. And I think that gets into what Dr. Bjorn's asking as well. To what degree the tick disorders, the findings of circadian disruption, tick disorders are generalizable to other related conditions. And would you want to add any further just upon what you've said? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the, the general, um, you know, the general idea of, of shifting circadian phase and and being able to um, address core symptoms of, of disorders is, I do think it's generalizable and it has been shown in other, other psychiatric conditions, um, including uh, OCD and ADHD, 
um, for example. And um, but but I feel like you know this area there's still much more room to to study sleep, you know, to to provide sleep intervention um, and circadian intervention as part of psychi psychiatric disorders because a lot of the sleep researchers do do pay attention to sleep disorders and and so they're you know this is an area that's ripe for further investigation. For example, in ADHD, I've seen maybe two pilot studies in adults looking at light therapy, two or three. I, I haven't yet seen any anything in kids. Um, right. Yeah, and... Well, as a sleep researcher, I think it's great that you're looking at sleep and circadian rhythm processes in relationship to me mental health disorders. So thank you, Dr. Ricketts, for a very interesting presentation today. Thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. Nanthia Suthana. And Nanthia, welcome. Hello, thank Dr. you. Dr. Suthana is an assistant professor in residence, and we will hear from her about her work in intracranial neural mechanisms and neuromodulation of memory in naturally behaving humans. Dr. Suthana. Thank you for having me share my screen here. All right. So my lab is interested in uh, understanding the neural mechanisms of memory and also developing treatments for those that are impaired. And I'll cover um, one of those in particular today and focus the first half on what we've discovered in terms of the neural mechanisms underlying episodic memory or the memory for personal events. Now, traditionally in laboratories where we study these events, the um, the tasks that we have individuals do are quite restricted to showing stimuli on a screen. But as we all know, forming memories for dynamic experiences don't happen that way, right? They happen in the real world in complex environments with uh, naturalistic behaviors that involve movements, interactions with other people, uh, and complex stimuli co-occurring together. And so the question is, do the findings that we see in the lab translate to the real world? And this is ultimately important in order to translate treatment, uh, successful treatments to the real world that work for patients out, out there. So as I said, my lab is interested in spatial navigation and memory and how this occurs in the brain. And particularly during naturalistic behaviors in complex real world environments that often occur in the presence of others. Uh, my lab was established in 2015 and uh, here's a photo recently in 2020. So in the context of uh, psychiatric disorders, this, this translates very well to disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, where one of the earliest symptoms are these you know, uh, memory impairments, as well as a less severe you know, sort of precursor, possible precursor uh, disorder known as amnestic mild cognitive impairment. And then on the other side, where in Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment, you see you know, difficulties in forming and recalling these memories. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, you have a difficulty in forgetting certain traumatic memories or in the sense that they generalize to safe scenarios. And so I'll talk about particularly this one in, in this talk today. All of these um, disorders involve structures within the medial temporal lobe. This is an area deep within the brain that has structures such as the hippocampus, entorhinal cortex, amygdala. And these are one of the first areas to be affected, for instance, in Alzheimer's disease, where the cells begin to um, die and atrophy, and also are relevant for disorders such as mild cognitive impairment and post-traumatic stress disorder. And the numbers of these patients who are suffering is just increasing uh, astronomically over the next many years with really no treatments to help, uh, at least with Alzheimer's disease, and um, detect who, who will progress, you know, for instance, from MCI. In the case of PTSD, there's a subset of patients who are treatment resistant. And in these cases, you know, you, uh, creative therapies are needed to, to help these individuals. Much of what we know about the neural mechanisms of memory come from studies in freely moving animals. In fact, two Nobel Prize, uh, three Nobel Prize winners uh, are exist in this field for the discovery of place cells. These are cells in the hippocampus that fire in specific locations as animals traversing and running around an environment. 
Uh, the second pair of Nobel Prize winners, um, one for finding cells in the entorhinal cortex, which fire in a grid-like pattern as the animal moves through space. And there are a bunch of other cells that have been identified, including border cells. Um, and there's also other cell types like neurons that fire to an action as well as the observation of action and place cells that respond to a location of oneself, but also the location of another uh, conspecific. These are all single neuron mechanisms of memory, which we have very little data and actually no data in humans, in freely moving humans um, to date. So the question is, do these findings translate to humans? Uh, and can we understand the human brain in a similar way? Another finding that's relevant for the research we do are these brain waves or oscillations that oscillate in around uh, four to eight times per second. And they thought are thought to organize and reflect the single neurons that you see firing along these waves in a very temporally specific manner. But in humans, when I started my lab, these oscillations had not been recorded as, as well as these single neuron mechanisms in freely moving humans. So the question remained, again, do these findings from decades of, of research translate to humans? Why is it so difficult to record these signals in humans? Well, the techniques that we have and that my lab uses as well um, require participants to remain immobile because there are motion artifacts that overwhelm the neural signals of interest. So here are some examples uh, where participants, research participants have, have to lay still while the brain is being recorded. In some cases, movements are, are allowed. However, there are still large artifacts that overwhelm the signal and make it difficult to record these, especially record these like single neuron um, and, uh, and local oscillatory patterns. So they require mobility due to movement artifacts. And when they do allow for some movement, they are recording from superficial brain areas, not these deep medial temporal lobes that we're interested in. And uh, because of all these restrictions, the tasks that are used are usually stimuli presented on computer screens. Uh, in some cases, view-based virtual reality is used, where it's sort of like a video game 3D simulation of navigation. But again, in these individuals, uh, they have to remain still and virtually move through an environment. So when I started my lab, I was interested in trying to study these um, brain areas during movement. And I was able to do so because of a device that was approved uh, to be implanted permanently in individuals who have epilepsy, and now recently other disorders such as Parkinson's disease that can record brain activity in the medial temporal lobe structures. Currently to date, there are thousands, a couple thousand individuals who have these devices placed permanently for the remainder of their life or treatment. And it's to, the device is designed to record brain activity and stimulate to prevent seizures or to improve movement uh, impairments in Parkinson's disease, for instance. Now, the research opportunity here is that these patients have electrodes, recording electrodes in these areas that we're interested in. For the first time, we can uh, try to understand if these mechanisms that we see in freely moving rodents are occurring in freely moving humans. And that's what we did. I established a lab where we could record from these devices uh, with body uh, motion tracking and other wearable sensors. Now, the tricky part was that the devices, these clinical FDA approved devices were not designed for these research purposes. So we have had to build a bunch of accessories to integrate with the device. And that is uh, summarized in this paper here, where we are recording from a participant who has an electrode um, planted in the hippocampus. We're doing eye tracking, body tracking, so you can see their position in the room here, and in real time recording the, the brain activity. We're actually in the outside of the lab room looking at this data in real time. And we're able to do that because of a bunch of accessories that we've built in a backpack that the participant wears, as well as a, a wireless um, wand that is placed above the participant's head to uh, basically take the data off in real time, allow us to view it and synchronize it with these other wearables, such as eye tracking, pupillometry, and body position. There are a bunch of other wearable sensors that we've integrated. And that's just shown as a summary here, including um, physiological measurements such as heart rate, skin conductance, uh, video audio recordings, and then also head headsets such as augmented reality, which allows you to project 
virtual objects in the real world and virtual reality, which allows you to simulate the real world in a virtual environment. Um, we are able to, in this way, study a bunch of different variables uh, in a freely moving person, such as not just changes in cognitive state or visual auditory cues, but also self-motion cues since they can move around without motion artifacts uh, in ecologically valid environments or more valid environments, and also study the naturalness of movement and behavior. One of our first studies was just simply having individuals walk around, and we found that as they were moving around, which shows is shown here in a sped up video, uh, straight in straight lines or in circular lines at slow and fast speeds, that theta oscillations do in fact exist in humans, but much less uh, frequently than in the freely moving animal studies. And that these theta oscillations around eight hertz are happening more often when the individuals are moving at faster walking speeds compared to slower walking speeds or not at all. And this was significant over the entire uh, sample of participants. So this, this suggested to us that there is some uh, translation of findings, however, different differently, because in animals, this theta oscillation is quite continuous, whereas in our case, it's about 10% of the time. So the remaining years after this, we wanted to understand, well, what's modulating this, this amount of theta? And so our next study was to look at a spatial navigation study, not just simply walking around. And in this task, they had the participants had to look for and learn the location of hidden targets. Um, but what we found was that these theta oscillations increased whenever the participants were close to the environmental walls, the boundaries of the room, which are known to serve a very important role in navigating one space and remembering sort of, you know, important critical locations. What was further interesting about this study that a postdoc in my lab designed is that he also recorded their brain activity while they're sitting in the corner of the room, observing himself do the task. And what he found is that those same theta oscillations increased whenever he was close to the environmental wall or boundary. So these theta oscillations are marking the position of the individual as they're moving, but also of another person during observation. And this just shows a video of that finding. Participants walking towards the wall, theta activity goes up as they reach the wall and go, goes down. And this is happening in real time. We can view it uh, in real time with th this backpack that they're wearing. And this, you can see what they're seeing as well as their um, position in the room. Here is the participant in the corner of the room watching the experimenter walk. And you're gonna see similarly, theta activity in the participant is going up as the researcher approaches the wall and goes back down again as they leave the wall and the green circle showing their eye gaze position. So this was exciting for us in terms of using this platform to investigate a scientific question that had never been uh, looked at before in, in moving humans. Next, we wanted to see what was driving or what was modulating this theta activity. And we found that it only occurred during a particular part of the task a part of the task where they were searching for target locations, not when they were just simply walking to the wall queue. There were, I don't know if you saw it, but in the video, there were these paper colored pieces of paper on the wall. And there was a condition where we asked them to just simply walk to let's say red two. And that alternated with a condition where we asked them to find and learn a hidden target location. So this boundary modulation of theta only occurred during target search not during this no target search period where they were simply walking to visible cues. What was further interesting is that this also occurred during the observation period. So their activity was modulated by the other person's position near boundaries, but only when the participant was required to keep track of the person's location, not when they were simply, you know, walking to a wall location. And this is noted by an X, which is the participant's um, button press, signifying that the experimenter arrived at a target location. So before the target location, when they're presumably searching for the target, this boundary effect occurred and not afterwards. Um, after the study, we want to understand how does memory modulate this? So we designed a memory task where it, in virtual reality, participants, uh, sorry, participants had to search for these uh, halos, these cylindrical um, colored translucent sort of, you know, halos, we call them here, alternating with a 
condition where they had to walk to an arrow and then they had to remember where those halo locations are. So go to the yellow halo and they would get feedback if they performed correct or incorrect. And this is showing a video of someone performing this task in VR. And this is not an easy technological um, uh, accomplishment to be able to synchronize the brain activity in VR with motion tracking and um, other behavioral measures. Just to show the performance participants, this shows six participants, do learn the positions of these halos over time. You can see their error in terms of position, recall position to the actual halo position goes down over time. And this shows a top-down view of their trajectories with the halo positions overlaid. And what we found is that theta oscillations, inc theta oscillation increased, power increased, only during correct uh, trials, correct retrieval trials, not during incorrect trials, or simply those visible trials where they got feedback. And this is summarized here with uh, each circle representing a channel across several participants, showing elevated theta power during correct retrieval trials compared to incorrect and visible. And that increase in power is occurring about a half a second before the onset of re recall. So the button press where they arrive at the location and, says, and say, this is where I remember this location to be. Um, which presents an interesting, you know, uh, finding in terms of the time course of these brain activities, uh, oscillations relative to the moment of recall. We also found that this memory related um, activity was occurring during eye movements. So we recorded eye movements and we saw that theta oscillations increase in power during saccades, these eye movements, compared to fixations, and that this was occurring during the memory condition of the task. So when they had when in a different task they had to find hidden target locations and retrieve them from memory, not during a non-memory related condition of the task. Um, and that's summarized here. And furthermore, this uh, this saccade related increase in theta was happening during high performance trials, not low performance trials. So high performance and medium performance trials, not low performance trials, altogether suggesting that theta oscillations are modulated by position, memory, and happening during saccadic movements. So I'll summarize that with one slide here. These theta oscillations, and I didn't talk about it, gamma as well in some cases, are modulating by, modulated by walking speed in a much less prevalent manner than in freely moving animals. They're modulated by position in terms of proximity to boundaries. They're modulated by successful memory during correct retrieval trials compared to incorrect and visible. I didn't talk about walking direction, so I'll skip that here. They're modulated by the presence of others or the position of others in the case that I showed you and eye movements, um, which are thought to sort of, you know, help anchor uh, the, the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe for incoming relevant visual information that needs to be encoded and recalled. So that's a summary of uh, the portion of, of my lab that uh, tries to understand the neural mechanisms of memory in these regions that are relevant. I'll now shift to um, one translational study that uh, we're, we're under, we're, is un underway. But I'll also say that this platform we've built has been useful outside of our own laboratory and in other studies in our laboratory. One such study recently published looked at patients with binge uh, eating disorder where they used the same device and the platform that we built to record activity in um, relevant areas during viewing of, of food and various stimuli during you know, symptomatic periods in these patients. We are also in our lab looking at social interaction, sleep, um, movement. We have an outdoor study, that, that uh, navigation study, memory study that takes place outside as well as a collaboration with Katie Cross to look at Parkinson's disease and patients who have these devices implanted for um, impairments, movement related impairments. I'll focus on one study that a graduate's MD PhD student in my lab and a research associate together have led looking at memory in PTSD. This study was, is a clinical trial with so far two patients that are, were enrolled and have completed the trial who have treatment resist, resist refractory post-traumatic stress disorder. These patients have tried all sorts of treatments um, and uh, are veterans, uh, part of the VA, Los Angeles VA, that have not been successful. And so this, um, the, they were enrolled in this, in this uh, trial to get um, go through a series of tasks, such as an emotional image presentation task and an exposure task that presented their trauma, their specific trauma, uh, as well as a pleasant memory. And this occurred over the course of one year where we were recording activity from this device 
as well as triggering stimulation uh, after month one to try to treat their symptoms. This shows an example patient with electrode in the amygdala. So they have bilateral amygdala electrodes implanted. And this shows the data from those tasks. So during the emotional image task, we see elevated theta power, but now in the amygdala, uh, during negative images compared to positive and neutral, and positive and neutral were now different, so we combine them here. We don't see the same effect in non-TRPTSD patients, in other words, epilepsy patients who also have amygdala electrodes, but are not suffering from treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. And in those same two patients, we see this theta elevation during um, traumatic memory exposure, their specific individualized memory, compared to a pleasant individualized memory. And we see it during at-home symptoms where they uh, have particular symptoms that they can mark in time and on the device um, as symptomatic. And this could be due to something that they see you know, on the news or a particular event in their life um, that occurs, such as fireworks or something. Uh, this just shows that theta activity peaking here right around one second after the onset of the image presentation. So we then wanted to use this data um, to inform the stimulator. So this device can record activity and trigger stimulation in the case of epilepsy and, and Parkinson's disease, but in now we're doing it here in PTSD for the first time in two patients. And here's the clinical uh, data from these two patients. So both patients improve over the course of one year. One patient improves quite dramatically, pretty much right away with stimulation onset and uh, leads to a pretty low, what you see here is a CAP score, the clinician administered PTSD scale, uh, and also improves on the self-administered scores as well as the subtest, particularly re-exposure, or re-experiencing, sorry. So you see the clinical improvement is quite dramatic in this first patient. And that also follows uh, against the daily stimulation therapy counts, which are pretty much increasing right away in this participant to about 2000 stimulations per day. In the second patient, this, this change is much slower. And if you look at the daily stimulation counts, that increases also much slower. It turns out that this patient was programmed differently slightly from this one, such that the stimulation threshold was a lot lower and uh, wouldn't what basically wasn't receiving the same amount of therapies. That was remedied uh, somewhere around here and you can start to see the, um, uh, the stimulation therapies going up and also some clinically meaningful improvement scores in the CAPS. So this is very promising. It's only two patients and we hope to replicate this in several more. Um, from a research standpoint, it was also interesting because they re returned to do those uh, tasks, the image related task and the script driven imagery task uh, every few months. And as I showed you, theta activity increased um, during negative images in the first session in both patients. But over time, we noticed that that increase is gone and is no longer significant. The difference between negative and positive images is no longer significant, suggesting that this data activity may be a reflection of treatment response and be related to outcome, although we need to look at this a little bit more. So in summary, amygdala theta activity increases during the presentation of aversive stimuli and personalized traumatic memories. That signal being used to trigger stimulation um, could relate to uh, could could provide a you, you know uh, personalized therapy for that for these patients that are treatment resistant and one that is one that is ecologically valid and works outside of the lab and in their home environment and uh, in fact one of these patients anecdotally mentioned that they were happy to be able to enjoy fireworks for the first time at Disneyland with their children which they had never been able to do before and so this is just an image depiction of how potentially this therapy could work such that um, the stimulation, the closed loop stimulation triggered by the signal could uh, basically prevent these uh, symptomatic episodes out in the real world, such as when they, you know, hear fireworks um, during 4th of July or at Disneyland. And as an overall technological summary to this talk, I also wanted to mention that this platform we've built is shared with the broader community. It enables intracranial recording and stimulation of brain activity during freely moving behaviors in humans. When you combine that with wearable technologies such as body sensors and VR, AR headsets, you have an opportunity to characterize the neural correlates of complex real world behaviors, not just memory and navigation that my lab does. And that's one of the goals of my lab is to enable others 
to look at outside of these domains. You also have an opportunity to test neural mechanisms to, in, to develop new therapies. And that's where this work gets really exciting for me um, to really help people who have uh, debilitating disorders that don't have treatments uh, currently that are effective. The code is all shared uh, online. And then I'll leave with just one more slide which is that we are also very interested in developing new technology. So we have a new device called the NeuroStack, which records single neuron activity during walking behavior. And we've recorded it, a graduate student, uh, now postdoc in my lab, Orish Topolovich, has recorded this um, single neuron activity in a, a few patients who have epilepsy, who have implanted microwire electrodes, using this handheld device that can be put in a backpack uh, along with eye tracking in the EMU. And uh, this device is designed to be fully implantable such that eventually the devices that are used now can be upgraded to record single neuron activity and have a bunch of other advanced features that the current devices do not have. And so with that, I hopefully leave you with an exciting future, that one that I'm very excited about, that uses uh, novel neurotechnologies in humans to advance neuroscience, and also advance therapeutic treatments for psychiatric disorders. Thank you for listening. This is the group actually I'll highlight, the graduate students and postdocs who have done all of this work. Uh, and really it's a pleasure to work with them and colleagues and collaborators. This work is not done alone in my lab. It requires many, many people, clinicians, engineers, and um, industry partners, and of course, funding. Dr. Suthana, thank you very much. Uh, really an amazing body of work um, and amazing technological advances um, on display here today and great innovation. Uh, we have a couple of questions that actually Dr. Lovetsky echoes my sentiments as well, that this is an amazing body of work. Um, but she asked whether there's these technologies are applicable to exercise movement-based interventions on neuroplasticity and on cognition. Uh, asking whether they can be or whether they have, whether they can. I guess can and have. Can and have, right. So, um, you know, right now, the device that we've built, the accessories, they do require some, you know, you know, you can walk around, but you can't sort of go crazy in terms of the movements you're making. However, we, um, we have hired an engineer from the company with this purpose to basically miniaturize all of these things such that in the future, more dynamic movements such as exercise and um, can be explored. We do have a study looking at body movements that involve a little more than just simply walking, it, it, particularly with the social interaction. Um, so there, there are efforts underway, but we do need to minimize the, the body sensors that we're using. Mm -hmm. You can see this clunky like sort of wand. Um, so that is a goal for us. And I have an engineer whose primary purpose is to do that. To miniaturize everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. And there's a great NIH funding uh, call that just came out for this purpose as well, um, the brain behavior quantification synchronization. Excellent. People are interested in that. Um, I think you just wowed everyone. I don't see any other questions. questions. Okay, maybe it was just too clear. <laughs> no, you're right on time actually. If there are, oh, there's one other question, Colin Price has a question for you. Do you want to read it? Sure. Um, have there been any investigations into the effects of pharmacology on these neural recordings? Uh, great question. And um, while I haven't, we haven't published on this, we do keep track of all the medications because these are all patients that have, you know, some sort of disorder that requires medications. For instance, epilepsy patients. Uh, so we have, we do keep track of all the medications. We need larger sample studies and to look at re really this question in a different way um, to be able to answer it. So we haven't done it so far, but. It's a very interesting question. I'd be interested in looking at it in the future. Right. Especially with the with comparing the different patient groups. So this these devices are now implanted in epilepsy patients, Parkinson's, OCD, PTSD, binge eating disorder, um, depression. And so if you can start start to look across patient groups and medications and start to see it, relationships there could be interesting. Don't have any other questions, Dr. Susana. We're out of time for your presentation. So thank you again for very exciting work. And we're going to move on to the next person, who's Dr. Agatha Lenarowitz. 
and Dr. Lunarowitz is going to be talking with us today about attention control impairments from lab to real world. Uh, Dr. Lunarowitz. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity. Um, so I am faculty here in the Department of Psychiatry, as well as a member of the Semmel Institute um, and the Brain Research Institute um, and operations manager at the Stanglin One Mind Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. So many of us in this uh, mental health field have a motivation, a connection to mental health. And I wanted to spend a few minutes explaining mine. Um, so mine comes from um, Białystok, Poland, which is where I was born and raised many years ago. Um, and I was about six or seven, I was um, in my great grandmother's house after school when there was a huge pounding on the door. Um, and that pounding turned out to be my uncle uh, who ran in and started running around the, the, the apartment um, yelling and searching. Um, and I was a six-year-old, I was um, petrified, so I hid behind a couch um, and sort of closed my ears and waited until my grandma um, controlled the situation. And this, this, this experience um, left me quite frightened. Um, I didn't know for many, many years what happened. It was many years later that my parents explained that um, my uncle has schizophrenia and had an episode. Um, but, but they really didn't explain anything, right? Um, which is how it went many times. Um, and that left me um, confused, but eventually turned into curiosity. And so when I went to undergrad um, at the University of Toronto, I was on uh, in the pre-med track to become a psychiatrist. Um, I did some reconnaissance uh, doing booking assessments with psychiatrists to learn what the process is about. Um, but then I got distracted by this book, which might be familiar to some of you. This is from the 90s, a book by uh, Michael Posner and Marcus Reichel called Images of Mind, and it captures the early product of the neuroimaging field. Um, and so I got fascinated by the technology. It's just this power to look inside the, the skull um, and access the brain, which perhaps holds the, uh, the, the, the key to the mind and can explain uh, these deviations in behavior that are so powerful. And so I ended up working at the Rotman Research Institute for um, several years in undergraduate with a fantastic researcher, Randy McIntosh, uh, learning these methods um, in the context of primarily aging research in, in the domain of cognitive control. And so that's, that's really the start of my journey. I did my um, PhD at Princeton with John Cohen, Ken Norman, and I focused on cognitive control and executive function, which very broadly speaking is that um, mysterious ability which allows us to um, route our behavior in, in line with goals rather than being um, driven, right? Driven by habits, driven by instinct, um, salient stimuli. Um, and much of this work touched on mental health, but Princeton did not and does not have a clinic. And so it stayed sort of separate, very abstract um, and mechanistic. Uh, and this pattern continued when I came here to UCLA to do my postdoc with Russ Poldrack and um, some technological innovation with Mark Cohen on concurrent EEG fMRI. Um, and I kept doing basic research in the in this sphere of cognitive control, whether through response inhibition, um, more recently attention control. But at some point I was feeling a little bit empty. I sort of deviated from my original motivation um, and pondered sort of switching tracks, going back to med school, um, you know, trying to find some meaning to the work that I was doing. And, and I, at that time, came across some websites that some of you may um, find familiar. Um, these are uh, for Trek, which I'll mention, and UCLA Center for Cognitive Phenomics. Both of these are projects that have ended many years ago. Um, but I was very giddy when I found them because I discovered that there is a place that um, marries basic science and this translational sort of um, uh, uh, approach to, to trying to understand both basic science and trying to do something about it. Um, so this started my journey at the Semmel Institute, and I was very, very fortunate to work with many individuals over the years, kind of learning, developing my clinical perspective, which I, did, I didn't get through education. Um, I worked with, very fortunate to work with Dr. Stern um, in neuroimaging of uh, 
uh, lateralized temporal lobe epilepsy, as well with um, Dr. Robert Bilda, with whom I still collaborate um, largely on elements of working memory and, and processes of working memory in the brain. But my um, the clinical arm of my research really developed under the mentorship of Dr. Sandra Liu and Dr. Jim McCracken um, as part of this um, TREK study, Translational Research to Enhance Cognitive Control, it ended in 2010, um, that was a large clinical trial uh, that tested the efficacy of combined medication in ADHD. Um, and as part of the study, um, there was neuroimaging data collected, um, EEG data, fMRI data, um, DTI data, et cetera. Um, and I was part of this study to understand the neural mechanisms of cognitive control in ADHD and how they may deviate, if at all. So where we started was trying to figure out what are the processes that explain large working memory behavioral deficit that are observed in ADHD. So what's working memory? Um, it used to be when we had to remember phone numbers. We don't do that anymore. Um, so now it's probably when we remember the PIN code for two-step verification, right? Um, here is a task that uh, can, can test this formally. We remember the location of three dots. Uh, the dots disappear. We have to remember those locations without any support externally. This is the working memory part. Um, and then we retrieve that information. And so the behavioral effects in this task are large. Kids with ADHD um, have worse performance here than kids without ADHD. So we were interested in understanding why. And so um, what I show you here is the EEG data analysis. We looked at EEG data because of its phenomenal temporal resolution. And what we found was that there are these oscillations. Um, these are in the alpha range, which just means they have about 8 to 10, 12 cycles per second. Um, and if we look at the strength of these oscillations, which we'll call power, the magnitude, um, we find that during the encoding period, they drop. And then during the maintenance, they increase. Um, and what was particularly interesting, so we found group differences during the maintenance period, that there was a larger increase in these oscillations during maintenance, and that's really what we were expecting. Um, but what was interesting was that we also found differences before the working, ma working maintenance um, period, right, working memory maintenance period. Um, so here where the blue is, we found that there are differences here between kids with ADHD and without. And in fact, we also found differences, albeit smaller, in some of the event-related potential signals during the fixation. So what was revolutionary to me at the time was that I went in here looking for a magical sort of feature associated with this working memory deficit. And what became clear is that A, there are multiple cognitive processes and really neural processes that go into this single behavioral measure called working memory X accuracy performance. Um, two, that means that there may be different pathways by which you can, of course, um, affect this measure and so produce a deficit. And three, this means that there are probably individuals within this sample or the population called ADHD that come through these various pathways. So we published these data, and for um, some years we sought to replicate it, and so we published several other papers simply replicating the phenomenon. Um, and then we turned our attention to understanding the functional meaning of this phenomenon. Um, and so what we found was that the degree to which, to which these alpha modulations exist can predict inattention symptoms, but less so hyperactive symptoms, for instance. So there's a specificity to the attentive domain. Um, they predict performance on these working memory tasks. So we're capturing one element, one cognitive processes that contributes to these deficits. Um, they correlate with executive function scores that's captured through neurocognitive or neuropsychological mechanisms. And they correlate with academic achievement specifically through reading comprehension, which is very important because reading um, is affected in um, many cases in ADHD and changes the, the direction towards normalization of these modulations, tracks some of the changes uh, with medication effects. Okay, so there's functional significance um, to these uh, features. Now, importantly, we did not find, though we sought to, to, to look, we certainly looked, 
um, the, these oscillations are not a function, not a, a diagnostic biomarker, so they will not predict ADHD. And this is amazing work from Alfredo Polini, who went on to get his MD PhD, um, who tested all kinds of classifiers, um, deep neural networks, um, and repeatedly found that the distribution of oscillatory and other EEG features overlaps greatly between populations um, and shows a lot of heterogeneity within ADHD, which we know and which is consistent with what we suspected from our initial analyses. So we moved on then to look at the neural, um, well, we already have some neural features, but look at whole network associations of these EEG features. And so to do that, we use concurrent EEG fMRIs as shown in the picture here, where we're able to track concurrently these fast EEG signals in which we see the oscillatory patterns that we're looking for. So in this case, alpha, but it could be something else. And also look at the whole brain activity as we capture through functional magnetic resonance imaging. And that allowed us to um, find, to show, to test that the, these alpha modulations when we process uh, stimuli in working memory are associated with activity in the occipital cortex, which makes sense to what we're studying here, to the paradigm, and activity across, and connectivity across regions that really correspond, um, overlap with um, several attention networks that are known. Now, interestingly, in ADHD, the uh, modulations were associated with less visual cortex activity and more connectivity within dorsal attention network. Um, and that's really interesting finding. There are a couple different interpretations. We could say that this is a compens compensatory um, phenomenon where the attention network is actually really jumping in to compensate for poor, poor visual encoding. Um, so there really is a sort of control process problem. Um, you could also say that the dorsal attention network is just fine and there is a problem at the visual level, right? So this is not a working memory problem. Um, and I'll come back to that. And then um, critically, the, these, these changes were predictive of symptoms, but also performance more in general on this task. This is orthogonalized for effects of age in this particular sample. Um, so um, what, where are we? So what did we learn? Well, um, we think that alpha modulations may serve as a proxy of attention system recruitment. Um, perhaps it will allow us to identify, define objectively and an attentiveness phenotype uh, within neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and kind of interesting, uh, we're exploring whether more broadly these phenomena aren't associated with some element of executive function. So some support for this is coming from Juan Diego Vera, a psychology graduate student, and Renee Frischel, shown in the bottom there. What they did was run um, connectivity analyses on the combination of individual symptoms um, executive function scores from neurocognitive neuropsychological assessments and these EEG features, these alpha oscillations. And they found that the relationship between these alpha oscillations and the symptoms is mediated by the executive function um, scores. And interestingly, in both uh, inattentive type and motoric type symptoms, there were key symptoms like not being able to listen, are not being able to stay in the seat that were central, and I mean central both in a graph theoretic sense in terms of a central measure, but also central sort of intuitively in um, being uh, associated with this effect, with, the, with these phenomena and the EEG features. Um, so there may be symptoms that are particularly indicative of this particular impairment, okay? So we're going at specificity. Okay, so we, we said we, we might have a biomarker here. Um, of course, biomarkers no good if it's not if we, if we don't make it work. So our next, the second half of really what we do is try to do just that. And this is work with Dr. Sandra Liu and also Dr. Jenny Grammer, who is in the School of Graduate Education. Um, this is work um, supported by an R21. So the question we ask specifically is, can we use these alpha signals to identify and optimize learning environments for children with ADHD? And so here we assume um, that we can use this as an objective index of attentiveness. And we're going to use these amazing portable systems, as Dr. Satana also presented in some of her work, um, that are fully, fully mobile. There's no tethering whatsoever. And we can use them in a fully um, naturalistic environment. And this allows us to ask, 
whether there are particular contextual factors that support or hinder attentiveness. So if I am a child with ADHD, do I attend best? Am I most engaged in a teacher or student-led activity? Do I perform best in a group or individual activity? Um, in the context of the COVID environment, do I best in an online or an in-person activity, right? So very, very pragmatic approach um, to complement the basic science. And so what we've done so far is we started publishing the proof of concept sort of data to show that alpha power can certainly distinguish between several different conditions we're exploring in terms of attentiveness, such as video watching, individual work versus group work, pair work, and online versus offline activities. Um, the good stuff is coming, of course. Um, we have half of the sample, and the sample will be completed by the end of 2022 for really to dig into those individual differences. Okay, so I wanted to also um, spend a few minutes just talking about where we're going next in my lab. Um, so we are pursuing the basic research in the lab. We have um, some R1 funding in its fourth, almost fifth year, um, looking at a longitudinal follow-up to look at these oscillations in the kids that came in 10, 12 years ago for that TREK study that we started with. And so we're measuring, we're using concurrent EEG fMRI, and we're looking at both um, the oscillations, uh, we're looking at functional connectivity, we're looking at structural connectivity to understand both developmental trajectory and the predictive power of these um, oscillatory measures for outcome. And we just secured additional funding. This is just um, beginning also um, from NIMH to look at the mechanisms of um, alpha oscillations. Um, I, I, I presented here and I've told this story that they are associated with um, attention control network activation. And this is true, but we feel that likely that may um, partially be influenced by the context in which we do those tests. A lot of attention tests are done using spatial content, for instance. And so we want to prod a little bit deeper to further increase the specificity of what are these oscillations? Are they, for instance, um, network, particular type of network interaction, um, network efficiency? Are we looking at local signals um, in the visual cortex and some kind of a difference due to neurotransmitter imbalance? Are we looking at thalamic signals? So this grant will be really, this project will be about digging into that a little bit deeper. And then on the right here, we're continuing our translation work. And so this is, we're planning on expanding this R21 work into a larger study so that we can track attention states in real life. And the goal here, and we're moving here beyond alpha as well, I should know, we're looking at other um, signals in the EEG, um, but the key is to collect large samples of data to look at individual differences and in outcomes as a function uh, of internal context, which includes arousal, which includes your motivation, includes the internal driving forces, um, that affect other disorders other than ADHD, um, as well as external context. So individual differences of where you study, where you come from, um, uh, what the noise levels are, et cetera, um, to really understand what we can do on an individual basis to improve learning outcomes. And this work is, is really timely, um, not, not planned in this way, but the state of California agrees with us and has given the UCs um, some, some funds to do co collaborative work on the neurodiversity and learning. So we hope our work will be part of this bigger project. And then finally, I wanted to mention two, two other sort of passions of mine um, that I want to advertise. One of them is this Brain Electrophysiology Services Corps I've been working on for about a year, trying to get um, a proposal and an effort going. And this is not just me. Um, I have great support from Dr. Andy Luchter, Dr. Sandy Liu, um, Dr. Nancy Asatana, who you just heard from. Um, and we really want to share all this amazing technology um, and analytics, um, these portable re recording techniques um, with others in the center to really create a much more um, collaborative environment and really offer services because um, we really believe that um, this is how you do uh, successful translation of research. And I should say a lot of this um, translational work that we're doing, and, and as you've seen in other talks, um, interfaces beautifully with um, some digital therapeutics as is used in mHealth applications. So we hope we can shift a little bit in that direction as we learn more about that technology. 
And then finally, um, somewhat quietly, I've for the past few years been mentoring um, high school students at local high schools as well in Pasadena. Um, and in the past year and a half or so, I've been working with um, some amazing science teachers coordinators at um, a couple of schools, one in Pasadena, one at UCLA, um, to develop content for brain and cognition education seminars for high school students. So I include these here um, to advertise and really encourage anyone interested in participating or supporting to reach out to me. So with that, um, thank you to my amazing collaborators, um, obviously funders, my lab, all the participants, um, and, and to you as well uh, for your attention to two hours in. Um, and I leave you with some words of wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Holden, or my notes. Very interesting talk, very exciting to see the progress you're making, especially bringing it into the communities and the schools as you're talking about. So I'm waiting for some questions to come in. All right, while we're waiting for some questions, let me just uh, thank again, the Friends of the Semmel Board for their vision and supporting this term chair. The opportunities for us as an audience to hear these great and outstanding talks today from such early career scientists that show just tremendous promise for mental health research and treatment. And so uh, without further questions, I don't see any other questions. Uh, we will be closing today. And, and once again, thank you everyone for attending the talks today and for, and for the great work that our panelists uh, and speakers provided us to enjoy today. Best wishes, goodbye.